is a Jacquard loom and uh, it was probably made back in the late 1800s and the most unique thing about it is it was the first data memory machine made and uh, these little pieces of wood have little pins in them and it winds through there and it tells the machine which of these shuttles to lift and what time and for how long and uh, that way you can make different patterns. If you want a different pattern you can take this off and slide on another one that, that tells it how to make another pattern. And Mr. Jacquard that invented it, this was one of the first times that they were able to have big uh, floral patterns and big paisley patterns. Before things were a lot simpler in the weaving. And even now you've heard of a Jacquard print or a Jacquard print and usually that's a big floral design. And they go through every one of these little eyes in these heddles. There's one little thread that goes through every eye of heddles here and all the way back. And then it has to go through this comb in the front, all of them. So it must have been a very tedious job to put the warp threads on these machines. With wet felting, the fibers cling together and it becomes basically a big mat and you can't pull it apart if you pull and pull and pull. And if you cut it, it doesn't fray. And uh, in order to do that, you take a, some wool, this is a wool bat, and what makes it felt is you sprinkle some warm soapy water on it and then you create friction and all these little fibers have got little scales on them and they just hook together whenever they get the warm soapy water and the friction and mat together and then like I say you can't pull it apart so you take several of these however big a piece you're going to make and you lay them this way then the next layer you lay across wise so you don't have any holes in there and then you build it up for however big a piece you're going to make. Like this saddle pad was 21 of these and they were piled seven high to start out with. Uh, the educational silo. Yeah, my camera's really having a hard time in here. Hmm. We show them you know, how corn grows on those stalks and you know they've never seen it before and then we show them how you you've probably seen this how you take corn and the old corn sheller and all the corn comes out at the bottom and then again you get the empty corn cob and the kids just love this they think it's like magic it or something like magic. <laughs> yeah but they come out and pick pecans and either go in halves or they buy them and we show them for them here. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We That's sell a lot fun. of... We sell firewood, buy walnuts from people, because we're there um, a buy-up station mm. for a walnut company up in uh, Black Walnuts up in Missouri, and it's the only distributor and the only processor in the United States, Hammond's Black Walnuts. Yeah. And uh, people come in with truck pickup beds full of walnuts all through October. And uh, we uh, buy them, and there's a machine that Hammond's brought down for us. And it takes the real hard green cover off. Mm -hmm. And then we're able to bag up all the, the walnuts and weigh them and pay the people. And then Hammond's will be out here probably soon and pick up all the walnuts and pick their machine up. Wow. And it's fun to watch work. And even with that, the green hole that comes off of it, we put it in our manure spreader and spread it all throughout the pastures because it's good free pasture. Wow. Mm -hmm. Try to use every little bit that we can. And this is where you shear sheep as a demonstration? Yeah, every uh, end of April we have a big festival, sheep shearing festival, and people come and watch. And we do it inside here where, you know, April can be kind of rainy sometimes, so they can come inside and watch it no matter what the weather. But these shawls, the ones up above, are last year this is this year's down below and you can see on the right the crocheted one everybody did a little block 
And the next one's a woven one that a lady did on a little table loom upstairs. And then the uh, knitted one and the wet felted one. And then we usually do a, one that's needle felted, and uh, but we auction it off every year. So that's that's why the, it's not up there. And I did. To uh, take a drive in the truck to see the sheep, and I think um, that's probably the best place for me to share my heart because sheep are my passion. You know, um, we really got started here with the sheep on the farm almost 25 years ago. And the Lord said, "Feed my sheep." Only it wasn't like Peter, where he said, "Feed my sheep" three times. He said this to us repetitively, and uh, we thought we would raise cattle or horses, something we were more familiar with, but God wanted us to raise sheep. And one of the reasons we didn't understand until we got them home, one of the reasons was so that we could teach people about sheep and the Great Shepherd Jesus using that sheep model. So as soon as we got them home, one of my best friends, a homeschool mom, uh, called and said, would you take my children and I out in the pasture and teach us about the sheep and the great shepherd Jesus. So stammering around, I found a few scriptures, <laughs> of course, Psalm 23, and that's how this ministry was birthed, out of obedience. Um, I had actually been the uh, sheep uh, expert, if you will, in Northeast Oklahoma at that point in my life as a veterinarian, because most veterinarians are not so interested in sheep and goats, and especially not 30 years ago. Um, and being a woman in what was then a man's world, veterinary medicine, I got the leftovers. So I decided to be good at it. That was sheep and goats. And uh, so again, obedience has driven us uh, to the place of this ministry. And it's so interesting, as the ministry has grown and we find ourselves going to different places in the world, we visit with uh, nomadic shepherds all over the world. We've learned so much from them about how to take care of flocks naturally um, and on green pastures. And then the biblical understanding how the shepherd is gentle and kind and good and uh, how the sheep are trusting and obedient and uh, love the shepherd. And uh, it's, a, it's just this beautiful relationship that can't be understood uh, until you live it. We have an internship program here at the farm, and that is to help to train up farmers, uh, five different venues. Um, they can do mostly uh, sheep, and animals, uh, Bible garden, farm museum, mission, which is especially uh, mission shop oriented, and wool mill, or they can do a blend of everything. And uh, with every one of those areas, of course, goes scriptural teaching as well as um, the teaching of how to. And our how to is a simple version. We're not an industrialized wool mill. We are very simple and very mobile. And um, so it, it's good for us to be able to train people in America to replace the dwindling uh, farmer population that we have uh, in this country. And then as we have done that, it's been so neat to see how God has used those building blocks to help do ministry and teaching in other nations. For example, uh, I started the wool mill with just a spinning wheel and my laundry room in my house. And uh, it's not too much bigger than that right now, but because it was such a simple model, we uh, have begun to do what we call remote non-electric wool mill plants. And we can take the equipment in two suitcases and help to provide um, a, a source of income for the people in that community. So the whole village or the whole orphanage or whatever it might be will share that wool mill, non-electric equipment, just a drum carter, spinning wheel, uh, looms, felting materials, 
And uh, so it's really neat just to walk with God in obedience and see how he works the steps out for us. Wonderful. We do a pecan harvest, but this year there isn't a pecan harvest because we didn't get enough rain in uh, late fall. Uh, and that's the way it is for all of our counties around here. Sometimes people don't understand how important the rain and the climate is to food production because we're such an instant society. We can go to the store and get whatever we want. And so we don't see that there is no product. We don't see what might be driving that price up. You know, we started our educational tours just out in the pasture, and uh, for probably about 17 years, that's where we were, just out in the pasture. And uh, one day, a big Oklahoma wind blew up, and I said, Lord, what am I going to do with this busload of kids in the pasture? It was not safe. And so his answer was this big, beautiful barn. We call it the tour barn. And uh, over the years, we've developed this into a museum. Um, and we'll just walk through and look at some of these things. This is a, a milk sheep project. Um, our interns do a project. It can be indoors, it can be outdoors, but something that will continue to give information to people uh, when they come to the farm. So uh, people don't always understand that you can drink sheep milk. Even the Bible talks about sheep milk. It actually says it would be a stupid man that didn't know to drink sheep milk. <laughs> And a great percentage of the world population do consume sheep milk. Very, very healthy product. Um, down here, this is our uh, aquarium, terrarium, herbarium, uh, Oklahoma farm. Uh, aquarium, terrarium, herbarium, earthworm farm. And this is a part of our intern training. I tell the interns, if you can't maintain these, the aquarium representing the pond <laughs> and the earthworm farm representing the dirt and the terrarium as the, the plants, then you can't maintain a farm. It takes diligence. And so it's just a little teaching area for people that come to visit and for our interns. <clears throat> Let's see, honey, we do have honeybees on the farm and uh, such a wonderful product. We love the honeybees. We also love wasps. They are beneficials, beneficial organisms that get rid of things I don't want on my plants. So I like the wasps, but they can't be in my house. <laughs> this is a uh, display of a, a farm that was uh, given to us by a young man that worked here for a while. Um, and he moved on uh, out of the state and he didn't know what to do with his lifelong collection so he donated it to the farm for use probably until he has a son <laughs> that will one day inherit it down here we have the um, veterinary display I am a licensed veterinarian and I graduated 32 years ago and so most of the equipment that's in here actually came out of my veterinary hospital and it's all considered antiques now <laughs> which is really interesting even the glass tubes and the glass syringes nowadays we use plastic so the glass is uh, old and antiquated this is uh, the veterinary box that I used to take on my rural calls one of my favorite things in the museum is the yoke um, and the scripture in, in Matthew that says take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and if you look closely at that yoke what you'll see is that the one side is worn sliver thin and the other side is so very thick each one of those yokes is is made just specifically to fit that oxen uh, which is just really a fancy name for a cow and um, or a steer. Uh, this one is the well-trained older yoke and that oxen would train the younger animal. Of course the scripture references that Jesus is pulling the whole load and this is me 
I'm not broke in yet. <laughs> <laughs> we process fiber here on the farm. We um, teach all sorts of fiber classes. Uh, washing, carding, picking, spinning, dyeing, wet felting, needle felting, weaving. And uh, these are some of the looms that we use. This loom here is actually a union loom. It was made during the Civil War. And it was made to make uh, rag rugs when you watch Little Women. Um, and she sells the fabric in the balls for the limes. They were using a union loom to make rag rugs. But we use it to uh, weave our uh, wool uh, blankets and shawls on. These are Navajo looms. We'll be doing a uh, Navajo uh, weaving class uh, again this year. Uh, one of the places that we work is uh, with the Navajo Nation. Um, one of the things that I think is really uh, fun is, again, how God uses us in obedience. Um, we had a call. Someone wanted us to come to Navajo Nation to work with a place. It's not an orphanage, but it's... Um, a boarding school for children who may have one living relative so they're not an orphan uh, but they come and board there and uh, they wanted us to do a fiber mill start and to teach them some skills in working with their sheep and shearing animal husbandry and uh, at that time I was just learning Navajo weaving it's really hard to find someone to teach you and uh, God did send me uh, a little lady in her 90s that really helped. And I used a couple of books, but through it, um, I was thinking, Lord, you know, this is nonsense. Why are you taking this little white girl to the Navajo Nation to teach them how to Navajo weave? <laughs> and as I got deeper and deeper in it, I found that the reason that he wanted that to happen was so that I could teach the biblical truths, weaving those in with the weaving that we were teaching. And uh, so it's just good to be used to the Lord. It was really fun 